Although all killers are disturbing enough, children who murder are in a whole new league of their own. In other murders, most of the time there is some sort of motive or driving force that compels the individual to kill, whether it is an abusive upbringing, mental health issues, or a life of crime. Of course, killing is always wrong, but in most cases, we can get an insight into their mind and how they got to that point. But with children, it's much harder to understand as we all relate the idea of innocence to children and consider them people who need protecting. Well, as proven in today's case, it doesn't take a lifetime of turmoil and abuse to become a cold-hearted killer. Welcome to Twisted Minds. My name is James, and today we take a look at the case of Eric Smith, a 13-year-old who went on to kill a four-year-old in one of the worst ways imaginable. Eric Smith was born on the 22nd of January, 1980, in Steuben County, New York, to parents Randy, Havnar, and Tammy Smith. During his mother's pregnancy, Tammy had been prescribed an epilepsy drug called Trideon. Now, this drug was known to cause numerous birth defects, but when Eric was born, he appeared completely healthy. When Eric was just a toddler, his father began claiming that Eric was not his own child and left the family. After Randy left, Tammy took a paternity test, which proved that Randy was the father. After this proof, Randy was forced to pay child support, but chose to stay far away from Tammy and Eric. Naturally, Eric grew up believing that his father had abandoned him, something Tammy wasn't shy to broadcast to Eric and others who asked. At nine years old, however, Tammy told Eric who his father was, but contact was very limited. To make things just a little more messed up, Tammy started sleeping with Randy again, and they even had another child together. This turn of events meant that Eric would witness his father pulling up to take the couple's daughter out for the day, while Eric was left behind. People who were in Eric's life at the time said that it was around this time that the young boy's behavior began to take a turn for the worse. With that being said, not everything was bad for Eric, as he did get a new father figure in the form of his mother's new husband, Ted Smith. Ted later adopted Eric and was initially a good and compassionate father to him, especially when it came to understanding Eric and trying to help him with his school bullies. Sadly, Ted had a dark side that many people didn't see. While Eric was being beaten at school by the bullies, at times, Ted was doing the same at home. Although home life wasn't always happy, Eric loved the relationship he had with his grandparents, Red and Eddie Wilson. He would often visit the pair and, according to his grandfather, would always turn up with a big smile on his face and give both of them hugs and kisses. As Eric continued to move through school years, the bullying got worse. Looking like the kid on the cover of Mad Magazine with red hair and freckles, he was the perfect target for some of the other students. People also claimed that Eric would be seen cycling around for hours on his own as he had no friends. To make things worse, Eric's prescription changed, which forced him to wear thick-rimmed glasses. The poor kid didn't stand a chance. With all the constant bullying at home and at school, Eric developed a severe speech impediment and, due to a lack of concentration, was kept back an additional year at school. There are a few more little details about Eric Smith that you might want to know. As a young child, Eric began torturing and killing animals, showing all the telltale signs of a psychopath. For those who are veterans of the Twisted Minds channel, you will know all too well that many killers start off killing small creatures before building up to other people. There have actually been a lot of studies into this behavior and how different children possess feelings of violence. For example, young children are super curious and may pull the tail of a cat to see how it reacts. This usually builds the child empathy, but for some, the intentional cruelty toward animals can bring a joy to their black, twisted hearts. There are theories that by committing horrific acts against an animal, a person can become bored and seek a bigger target to chase the satisfaction they once felt. Around the time that Eric began torturing animals, the young boy learned that he could have developmental delays due to the epilepsy medication his mother was taking during the pregnancy. By the time he was 13, Eric had only reached the fifth grade. Although Eric normally kept himself to himself, his mother did describe him as a sweet and helpful boy who had a bad temper. By 1993, all of the anger, sadness, loneliness, and jealousy he was feeling began to bubble to the surface. Nobody in Savona, which only had a population of 970, 
foresaw the gruesome acts that were about to shake their sleepy little town. On August 2nd, 1993, 13-year-old Eric was riding his bike to a summer day camp that had been set up in a local park. On his way to the same camp was four-year-old Derek Robbie, who was on foot. Now, Derek's mother later stated that she would normally walk Derek to the top of the driveway, as she could see the park from her house, and would only go back inside once she saw the boy arrive safely. On that fateful day, however, she was busy trying to calm down Derek's younger brother. With Derek only having one block to walk with no roads to cross, she agreed to let her son walk alone with no supervision. According to Derek's mother, this was the first time the boy went anywhere on his own, and tragically, it was the last. Not long after Derek left the house, he met with the neighborhood quiet kid, Eric Smith. This was no chance meeting, however, as Eric had ridden to the camp and watched the other kids enter, and then he turned back to meet Derek. Eric lured the four-year-old boy by telling him he knew a fun shortcut to the summer camp. The two walked for a little while, and once he had the young boy in a remote wooded area, Eric punched the young child before picking up a rock and beating Derek with it. After that, he dropped two large rocks on his head before strangling him. At this point, Derek would have definitely been dead, but according to the killer, he had to make sure so he couldn't be told on. While the little body lay on the ground, fragile and broken, Derek took a stick lying on the ground and sodomized Derek with it. As Eric stood and looked down at the heinous act he had committed, he noticed Derek's lunch bag and decided to pour the Kool-Aid drink onto the deep wound on Derek's head. To continue the bizarre behavior, he decided to squash the banana that was also in the lunch bag. Eric then took off Derek's left sneaker and placed it right next to his right hand and then took off his right sneaker and placed it next to his left hand. After this, the young killer posed the body in an unusual way. After the murder and the strange acts afterwards, Eric grabbed his own bag and returned home as though nothing had happened. All in all, it took just five minutes from Derek stepping out of his house for Eric to complete the slaying. Just think about that for a moment. Five minutes, 300 seconds. It makes you wonder if Eric had planned out everything he wanted to do previously. As with everything he did to poor Derek, there was no time to stop and think up the next cruel act. At around 11 a.m. that day, Derek's mother, Doreen, went to pick up her son from summer camp. When she got there, however, she was told that her son never made it to the program. Naturally, she rang the police straight away struck by sheer terror. Derek was described as a good child and had never been out alone, which meant that his disappearance was extremely suspicious. The search party for Derek involved over 300 people, including people who worked at the summer camp, the police, and neighbors, including Ted and Eric Smith. Derek's body was discovered hours later, with the wounds being even too much for the police to handle. Because of this, the Robbie family were told not to see the body. Around this time, Eric's grandfather had a suspicion that something was wrong with Eric, believing that he was hiding something from the rest of the family. At first, Eric was not seen as a person of interest, but he decided to go to the police station to discuss the murder after his grandfather urged him. Eric first told police that he had not seen Derek on the day of his murder, but soon changed his story. Eric then claimed that he had been standing opposite the open field when he had seen Derek, the exact location the murder took place. When questioned further, Eric explained how he had seen Derek wearing a white t-shirt while holding a lunchbox. During the interview, police pushed Eric to talk about where Derek went next. As soon as the question left the detective's lips, Eric clenched his fists and accused the police of suspecting him as the killer. Bizarrely, after speaking with the police, he returned to the station to speak about the sexual mutilation that had happened to Derek, details that the police were yet to release. Even though Eric's behavior and knowledge of the crime were incredibly suspicious, the police let the boy go home, as they were worried he may have seen the body or the murder, but didn't want to say. The next day, they asked Eric to cycle his bicycle up to where he had last seen Derek. Eric was happy to oblige and rode them to the location where he first saw the young boy. It was in that moment that the police realized that he could not have seen the body and the damage done to it where he stood because 
all the bushes that were in the way. To add more evidence against Eric, the police were told that Eric once asked what would happen if the murderer was a child. The woman who answered said that the child would need psychiatric help. After hearing this, Eric followed up by asking about how DNA testing worked, a question that didn't get an answer, either out of lack of knowledge or the disturbing notion that they could be facing the killer of a four-year-old child. By this point, the police had decided that the murderer could be a child and even thought that the squashed banana they found in Derek's lunchbox backed this theory up. Because what adult would think to do that mid-murder? As a test, a woman from the community was asked to go to the local shop and buy ice cream, nuts, bananas, and syrup and told the local children she was going to make sundaes. Out of all of them, only one child asked for no bananas, Eric Smith. Five days later, Derek was buried, and two days after the funeral, Eric confessed to his parents what he had done. Carl Peters, Eric's great-grandfather, took Eric to the police station where he was arrested. The Savannah community was left speechless and stunned after hearing about Eric's arrest. Many were shocked that a child could have murdered another child. Some were angry at Eric, whereas some sympathized with the young killer, claiming he must have grown up in a toxic household to act in such a way. Shortly after his confession, Eric was subject to a psychiatric examination. He was eventually diagnosed with intermittent explosive disorder, which causes people to erupt with violence without warning. When asked why he killed Derek, Eric calmly replied, because instead of me being hurt, I was hurting someone else. Once Eric was in police custody, he never once denied the crime. At his trial, his defense attorney argued that Eric lacked the mental capacity, arguing that because Eric had acted normally after the gruesome murder, it proved that he was not mentally stable. It also argued that the years of being bullied at school had left Eric with high levels of stored up anger that resulted in him not being able to control himself. His defense attorney also suggested that Eric may have had other developmental issues. Besides the epilepsy drug his mom was taking during her pregnancy that had gone undiagnosed. The prosecutor, however, disagreed, arguing that Eric had meticulously planned the crime and had gone out of his way to be extremely cruel to Derek. After all, Eric had beaten Derek, bludgeoned him with rocks, and proceeded to sexual crimes to his lifeless body. Eventually, the trial came to an end and the jury rejected the defense argument. They believed that Eric belonged in prison as opposed to a mental health institution, finding him guilty of second degree murder. Eric Smith was sentenced to the maximum sentence of nine years to life in prison for the gruesome crime. Since then, Eric has been denied parole 10 times, with Derek's family speaking at every single parole hearing and sharing their feelings that Eric would be a danger to society if he was ever released. On October 5th, 2021, Eric attended his 11th parole hearing, which became his last, as the 41-year-old man was granted freedom. At the hearing at the medium security Woodbourne Correctional Facility, Eric said that he had become the bully he disliked, and that the moment he saw him, he knew he wanted to hurt him. He also said, I know my actions have caused a terrible loss in the Robbie family, and for that, I am truly sorry. I've tried to think as much as possible about what Derek will never experience. His 16th birthday, Christmas, owning his own house, going to college, graduating, getting married, his first child. If I could go back in time, I would switch places with Derek and endure all the pain I've caused him. If it meant that he would go on living, I'd switch places, but I can't. Two days after the hearing, board members had considered Eric's age at the time of the attack, the childhood abuse he experienced, and his clean prison record. After 28 years, Eric Smith was granted release after being told, the ruling should in no way be construed as excusing your heinous behavior of mitigating the terrible loss of life you caused. This ruling obviously came as an upsetting surprise for the family of Derek, who had petitioned and rallied against the release of Eric Smith for decades. In an interview, Derek's father, Dale, said that because his family is having to serve a life sentence for losing their boy in such a horrific way, that Eric's sentence should be a life sentence too. When asked what he would do after his release, Eric said he would go to live with his mother, while waiting for his fiance to move nearby. He also said he would use his prison training to get himself into an electrical or carpentry company. Just an ordinary life after years of infamy. Of course, 
Eric will no doubt have a name change to avoid his grisly past and may even choose to leave his state to start a new life. This means that before long, unaware customers could have an electrician or carpenter working in their house who has spent the majority of their life behind bars after brutally killing a four-year-old boy. Although the crimes were truly heinous, there is the argument that life in prison strips children of the chance at rehabilitation. There is also the argument that their mental health should be dealt with, rather than just locking them up and throwing away the key. It is believed that on any given day, 60,000 children under the age of 18 are locked up in juvenile detention centers in the United States of America, with many of those spending the majority of their lives behind bars. After hearing the story of Eric Smith, I would love to know your thoughts in the comments section below about child killers, and if, despite their young age, should they ever be allowed to walk free? Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the case of Eric Smith, and why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.